So we're in Numbers 4 through 9. From Mount 4, they sent out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out, up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we know this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and he bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people became, and the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. You may be seated. Good morning. Danny, one of the members and one of the pastors, privilege and a blessing to bring you God's word. Let's start, let's go to him in prayer. Father, we know that what we read is just not a near ink on our pages or fonts on our phone. It is your very holy word coming to us. Father, we know that apart from you, we can do nothing. So please work in our hearts now to not only be hearers of your words, but doers. In Christ's name. As we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving, it's important to consider the purpose and the original intentions of this holiday. This is from U.S. National Archives. Um, in November 1789, our president, our first president, George Washington, issued a proclamation saying that there should be a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to God. Later on in 1863, Abraham Lincoln encouraged that every last Thursday in the month of November should be a national holiday giving thanks and praising our beneficent Father who dwells in heaven in the heavens and provides all provisions. Congress listened to that, and under that same basis, declared this as a national holiday. The history of Thanksgiving was really intended, and at its core, a day where our hearts can be full of thanks towards God and the blessings in our lives, his work in our lives. In fact, the famous evangelist Billy Graham was quoted saying, for the Christian, every day is Thanksgiving. Well, long before things, long before this kidding or any of these guys, in Numbers 21, we come across God's people. And they are certainly not in any type of thanksgiving mood. In fact, they are doing the antithesis, the exact opposite thing of giving thanks, which is complaining. They are grumbling. Now, I don't want to jump into this text right away because it could be really easy for us to be self-righteously judging the Israelites here and wondering, man, why are they so foolish? How they how can they complain this way? Why can't they just have this Thanksgiving spirit in their hearts and be more thankful? But before looking at their situation and making any judgments, it's important for us to reflect on our own hearts. And I wanted to do this personally before I came up here and preached this text. So I took notes to see if this type of complaining and grumbling was in my heart. Even as we prepare for Thanksgiving, I wanted to know really how much thanks is in my heart in relation to my complaining and grumbling. And after one day church, I regret to inform you that I'm a really bad complainer. <laughs> I think that I've always intuitively known that, but it wasn't until this week where I was more aware of it preparing for the sermon that I learned how true it actually was. I want to take you into one day that I had this week just to show you the depths of my complaining. As soon as I heard my wife's alarm go off in the morning, I found myself complaining in my heart. <laughs> you see, unlike me, my wife can allow her alarm to go off, to go off and to continue to go off. <laughs> Letting it makes noise, she's making noise, and she's sleeping comfortably. <laughs> and I cannot do that, and so I'm not pleased waking up an hour and a half earlier than I need to be up, so I grumble. As soon as I wake up, I can, still, I can feel my heart complaining about all the things and responsibilities that I have to do at work. I complain because I can't find my shoes that morning. <laughs> Audrey is a bad morning person, and so when I start to com I start to complain because my two-year-old doesn't have the capability to comprehend time and the implications of her not waking up on time. <laughs> Foolish, I know, but yet I still complain in my heart. 
After getting her ready against her wishes, she insists that she wants to wear this other pair of shoes and not the ones that I put on her. And I complain about that. Before we leave, our dog Hamilton is stubborn. He won't pee or listen to go back into the house. So I complain about that. As soon as they get to daycare, tons of parents are dropping off their kids and I begin to be impatient and complain about how long it's taking to drop her off. On the way to work, as you can imagine, I begin to complain about traffic and the drivers around me, especially now that I'm running late to my first meeting in the day. I won't bore you with all the details throughout my work day, but in my heart and sometimes out loud, <laughs> complaining about students, complaining about professors and situations at work. I finally leave work and I'm driving home Alyssa calls and asks if I can coordinate dinner, but maybe it's not, maybe some of you husbands know this, but sometimes it isn't clear what they actually want. And so <laughs> I complain in my heart. I'm tired, exhausted, and feel emotionally deranged. Once I'm home, rather than having a happy heart about engaging and having family time with my wife and daughter, I can feel my heart <laughs> because all I want to do is be left alone. <laughs> Even at night, when I do get some alone time, to wind down, I jump on my PlayStation to play with friends and family. What do I do? I complain the whole time about how they're not playing good enough, about other players. I get it, it's just a dumb thing. But my heart still finds a way to complain. I'll spare you the rest of my day, but this is literally one day in my life. And yet it was filled with complaint after complaint after complaint, grumbling and more grumbling. Being aware of this allowed me to have a more humble posture coming to this text, and I encourage you to have that same posture. Because, well, if we're honest, we know that we are all complainers, and not any better than the Israelites here in Numbers 21. In fact, their hearts mirror and show us how much, uh, much about our own hearts and how they relate to God. And that's really the goal this morning. And it's the title of our sermon. We're going to see the cause, the consequence, and the cure for our complaining. The cause the consequence, and the cure for our complaining. The cause will be found in verses 4 to 5. The consequence will be found in verses 6 to 7. And the cure will be found in verses 8 to 9. So point number one, the cause of our complaining. The cause of our complaining, verses 4 and 5. Uh, before, we, I, before we, again, we go into number 21, I want us to actually turn our pages to give us some biblical context that I think is really important for this text. Turn to Numbers 14. Numbers 14 uh, to verse 9. Numbers 14, verse 9. I'll give you some time there to turn. Numbers 14, verse 9. In this passage, we have the nation of Israel. The book of Exodus, in the book of Exodus, they had been enslaved to Egypt. They were slaves. They were enduring hard labor. They were mistreated, disrespected. They had no rights. In their suffering, they cry out to God, and he mercifully listens. God in his goodness towards them keeping his covenant promises to his people, defeats Pharaoh and his army, and redeems his people from Egypt. He sets them free. And he promises to give them a land where he will be with them as their God and bless them as his people. These are the foundations of establishing a kingdom. God's presence with God's people in his place under his rule and blessing. However, once they reach the promised land, they disobey God. In fact, after seeing how God had freed them from Egypt, they won't listen to his word. Even after that happens. Here in Numbers 14, Joshua and Caleb come back, and look what they say there in verse 9. They came back from the, the land of Canaan, which is the promised land, and they say in verse 9, Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of this land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Now you may think, man, that sounds encouraging. We're guaranteed a victory. God's with us? Maybe it would have been appropriate for them, for them in that moment to celebrate. But instead, look at what they do. The very next verse, that the whole assembly talked about stoning them. God gets so angry with them in their rebellion. He tells Moses, look, I'm going to destroy all of them. I'm going to destroy all of them, and I'm going to start over with you. Because these people are so stubborn and wicked. Yet, look at Moses. He steps in as a mediator, verse 17. Look what he says at verse 17. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time that they left Egypt until now. <clears throat> Notice the basis of God's character 
his justice and love. And that's what Moses appeals to. And he asks God to forgive them. God, and notice that in verse 19, God has been doing this time and time again. From the moment they left Egypt until now, God has been forgiving them. So he does it. He forgives them. What does he forgive them for? Look at verse 26. Verse 26. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble, complain against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. See that? Complaining. Grumbling. And God gives a serious consequence. Look at verse 34 and 35. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it's like to happen against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community, which has banded together against me. They will meet their end in this wilderness. Here they do not. At this point, anyone who was older 20, over 20, would not see the promise for their disobedience. Anyone younger and their children would, but not them. And it was due to their complaining. They're going to wander in the desert for 40 years. And they do. They wander because God is intent on teaching them that they need to obey him. That they need to trust him. That they need to depend on him. So they wander for years. Now, as we go back to our text, we go back to Numbers 21. Let's go back to Numbers 21. Things seem to start changing for the better. This chapter is the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. They are reaching the end of these 40 years, and they're about to enter. They're, they're on the borders of the promised land. This is the moment that they have been waiting for. It's finally here. They are ready to move into the promised land yet again. Where their fathers had failed, they have a chance to do what's right. In fact, God displays his power to show them that they can indeed trust him, that they can obey him, that they can depend on him, because he's powerful and cares for them. In the first three chapters of Numbers 21, we learn that the Israelites had won their first major battle. Here's a foreign king, Arad, and he sees an opportunity to attack them, but he takes some of the Israelites captive. That's what we read there in the first verses of Numbers 21. Nevertheless, though, they call out to God, and God responds and allows them to defeat King Arad and the Canaanites. Notice they're defeated so badly that they call the place Horam, or destruction. That's how bad they beat the Canaanites, that they call that place destruction. This is to emphasize that this is no small thing. This first victory was a big deal, an overwhelming destruction of their enemies. The first battle on their way to finally enter the promised land. This was nothing short of a miracle. God had done this for them. He had given them this win, and now they're one step closer to establishing their kingdom. God's people in their land under his rule and blessing. Now, one might assume that when God works a miracle in your life, in your presence, that's so astonishing that your response would be one of thankfulness, gratitude, joy, you know, thanksgiving. I mean, you think like, wow, we just won this battle. Can you believe it? Against Arad and the Can Canaanites? God did that. This is really happening. God's got this, as we like to say. He has our back. This would seem the reasonable thing to assume here. But let's look at our passage, verse 4. From Mount Hor, they sent out by the way, way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient. In this verse, rather than going north and straight to the promised land, God guides them south to go around. And we'll eventually see, if you keep reading Numbers and the rest of the Old Testament, that God is intent on having them go around in order for him to lead them from victory to victory to victory, and to destroy all their enemies until they hit the Jordan River, uh, River and enter the Promised Land. That's his plan. Remember, God just displayed his power. They've gotten their first victory. They see a light at the end of the tunnel. They have turned this corner, and God displayed his power to them. To care for them. They have all the reason to trust him. And we read that their response is impatience. They want to enter in now. Even though God intends to be present with them and lead them, to victory after victory, they don't want to win. They want to get there ASAP, and now they want it even more because they know that God can do it. They don't want to follow God and trust his guidance. Their response is impatience. God had not only dramatically rescued Israel over and over again, he was present with them. He was guiding them. Yet, there was one obstacle that could prevent the Israelites from fulfilling God's mission. 
It wasn't Pharaoh or his massive army. It wasn't the Canaanite forces or any of the obstacles in the wilderness. The obstacle was the hearts of the Israelites, their own hearts. Think about this. They have been waiting for 40 years. And they waited to learn to trust God and depend on him. God had been guiding them and had proven himself faithful time and time again. They had seen their parents fail to trust God, even though after, even after he redeemed them from Egypt in a miraculous way. And now God does the same here. He gives them a victory. And rather than seeing that as all the more reason to trust God, they see it as an inconvenience. So they lose patience. They are so close to getting the promised land, but it isn't quick enough for them. He no longer wants way. But notice, it's not just a matter of losing patience. Look at verse 5. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and water. And we loathe, we hate this worthless food. They not only lack patience, but they begin to complain. And notice how it's framed. Speaking out against God and Moses, the mediator of Moses between God and his people. They're not willing to wait and be patient anymore, and here's what they have to say about it. I know this is framed as a question, but it's really more of an accusation. They essentially tell God, man, you just brought us out of Egypt to die out here. There's no food or water, and we hate your worthless food. Can you feel their hearts and what they're really saying here towards God? Like, really, God, this is your plan? More wandering in the desert, really? 40 years wasn't enough? Just bringing us out here to die? No food, no water? Great. Just this worthless stuff that you give us? Really, God? That's your plan? What's interesting, what's interesting to observe here is how quickly they're complaining they lose sight of reality. Think about it. In the same breath, they complain that they have no food while saying that they hate the food that they have. <laughs> they do have food. Throughout the whole journey in the wilderness, God had miraculously provided them manna. Wait for like bread that would fall from the heavens each day to feed them. Moreover, God had provided them water. Just a chapter before, God smacks a rock, he strikes a rock, and all, out comes all this water for their animals and for them to eat, to drink. They did have water. They did have food. That didn't matter. See, their complaining was an over-exaggeration, a misrepresentation of reality, a disregard of how God provided them for the last 40 years. They, they didn't care that God had provided them these things, or the very acts of those things even being a miracle, miraculous, right? In fact, to them, God's provisions were worthless. They were junk. The only focus yeah, on complaining like, and grumbling. And this is not even the biggest issue with their complaint. They say, no, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die out here? In the book of Exodus, chapter 2, we are told that the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out to God for help. They cried out for God to rescue them, and God does it. Their bringing out of Egypt was actually mercy. It was an answer to their own prayer, their cry for help. And now, they forget about that. They disregard that. They feel like God is being cruel by actually having redeemed them from Egypt. See, this complaining might not sound like a big deal, but we will see by God's reaction that it is. And we need to get this because if we don't, we feel like God's response here is too harsh or an overreaction. But really, it isn't when you think about what's happening here. So what can we apply as we, as we are trying to you know, do that? How can we really understand this? You see, complaining is the outward expression of a symptom that's something deeper in our hearts. See, if we recognize God as supreme and as sovereign over all creation, then complaining is sin because it often points to a dissatisfaction and a discontentment in our hearts towards God. This is really what's at the root of our hearts in complaining and grumbling. Now, I want to be clear here. There is a difference between complaining and grumbling that is described here and offering a complaint as an honest expression of God of what it's like to experience trials, anguish, hurt, pain, disappointment, and grief in a broken world. God wants us to be honest to pray to him, to express our fears, frustrations, and cry out to him. We see this over and over in the Psalms. Listen to Psalm 142. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaints before him. I tell him my trouble before him. The Lord welcomes that, brothers and sisters. He wants you to be honest in trials. The Psalms are a great model for us of how to honor God and our cries for help. 
seeking his mercy. However, that complaining is not this type of complaining. <laughs> this complaining is one of grumbling. It is not that. This type of complaining dishonors God because it accuses God of doing wrong. It accuses God of not being wise, of not being caring, of not being good towards us. See, oftentimes for many of us, we can see complaining as a normal part of life. In fact, we often are unaware of how much we do it. I know this was true for me until this week, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, even when we know we are doing it, we don't think much of it. In fact, we often feel like our complaining is justified and warranted. After all, it's just a good opportunity to simply vent out our frustrations and emotions. We don't see it as a big deal or as a major sin. We don't even acknowledge the sin. You know, we have verses like Philippians 2.14 that says, Do all things without grumbling or complaining. When we read that, we may think, really? All things? I'm going to do all things without complaining or grumbling? It seems like this pie-in-the-sky ideal. And even, again, while we may acknowledge it's a sin, we can see it as a respectable sin. <laughs> Jerry Bridges explains that a respectable sin is a sin that Christians minimize or tolerate in their lives because we think it isn't that big of a deal. We often only take seriously egregious ones, the obvious ones, but do not see our sin of complaining in this way. We see it as a respectable sin, one that doesn't seem like a big deal to us. However, as we're going to see in these few verses, the Israelites had completely disregarded all that God had done for them. God had redeemed them out of Egypt. He had helped them win a battle over the Canaanites. He had provided them with food or water, but none of that mattered. In fact, they assigned God with bad intentions towards them. They are accusing God of not caring for them, that God is leading them astray to die. They are deeming God as unwise, that God doesn't have their best intentions, that he is withholding good from them. In this moment, their complaining and grumbling was displaying what was going on in their hearts. See, brothers and sisters, the heart of their complaining is often the cause of our own, is it not? We become impatient in our own lives. Often, when God calls us to wait, when God does not give us something we want, or when God guides us in a direction that we see as difficult or inconvenient, or where there are situations or circumstances in our lives that are not ideal, or when we feel like God is withholding good from us. In, this, in these moments, we too often disregard the many ways that God has provided for us time and time again. We forget about the various examples and evidences of God's grace in our life while focusing completely on our complaining, because in that moment, that's all that matters to us. We want to have what we want, when we want it, how we want it. So we complain, we grumble. Even when God is being gracious in his provisions for us, we feel like we deserve everything we have and more. We think to ourselves that things would be better if I only had this thing or that thing. Maybe it's desiring to be married, a job, children, achievement, recognition, a house, car, approval. We feel that if we could just have this one thing, then we would be fulfilled. But when we don't have them, we feel as if God is withholding good. We feel like we have the right to complain, and oftentimes the main cause of our complaints is that we feel that God isn't enough, that he isn't wise, that he doesn't know what's best, that he isn't good to us. So let me ask you, brothers and sisters, currently, what do you want so much in your life that it's causing you to complain and grumble? What do you find yourself grumbling about most in your life? What's causing you to doubt God's goodness to make you distrust God? When you think about your particular situation or circumstance, what does your grumbling say about who you think God is? I would encourage you and humbly come to God and ask God to show you where you tend to complain. For most of us, we are tempted to do this in moments where we feel like we're not in control or when things are going, out, going our way. We tend to blame others. We tend to blame our circumstances. We believe that we deserve our way when that's not actually true. When we are humble and more aware of our complaining, we start to see how much we desire our own kingdom rather than focusing on God's. When we complain, we think that everyone and everything, including God, should function to meet our desires. We become the center of our lives, and we expect to be the center of people's lives as well. When we grumble and complain, we declare our distrust in God's sovereignty and his rule over our lives and say that he isn't enough, that he isn't good. This is at the root. This is the cause of our complaint. 
It's important to assess our hearts, brothers and sisters, because this isn't some minuscule, inconsequential action. It's an attack and an assault on God. It's rebellion and it's sin and deserving of judgment. That brings us to our next point. The consequence of our complaining. The consequence of our complaining, verses 6 and 7. Let's look at the consequence that the Israelites face for their grumbling and complaining. Verse 6. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel, of Israel died. The consequence, the result of their complaining, the judgment for their sin was death through these fiery serpents that bit them. I don't know about you, but this is terrifying to me. I absolutely hate snakes. I hate snakes so much. <laughs> and just thinking about God sending tons of snakes my way out of nowhere to bite people and to bite me, I mean, that would be terrifying. These snakes aren't your typical snakes either. The word fiery doesn't necessarily mean that the snakes are on fire, but it's more to describe the bite and the color of the snakes. They're, they, they are reddish snakes whose bite literally feels like you're burning. Almost like the snakes are on fire because of how the bite is. It's meant to describe how volatile it hurts. It's bad, and people are dying from it. And you, can, you might be thinking, what in the world? This seems harsh, doesn't it? But again, consider that grumbling and complaining are not ultimately the heart's responses to your circumstance, but to God. See, the judgment for the complaining is so significant because it is the same heart that is behind any sin that we commit. See, if we like God's, if we don't like God's action or we see it as an overreaction here, we're not adequately understanding our own hearts and how just these consequences are. The same heart behind the Israelites here is what led to sin enter the world in Genesis 3. That's what led to sin entering the world, is it not? Adam and Eve are literally in paradise. No sin. Nothing is wrong. In a place where things are very good. And what happens? In a situation, even in a situation, a circumstance where everything is perfect, what does Satan do to tempt Adam and Eve? He, as a serpent, comes into the story, and he makes them he makes them doubt God's goodness. He makes them question God's provision. They have everything they want in the garden. It's paradise. It's very good. And yet, Satan zeroes in on the one thing they can't have: the fruit of the one tree in the garden. And he questions them: Is that good enough for you? Will you really be satisfied without having that one thing that God withholds from you? He put God's character in question. Satan tells them that if they eat this fruit, they will be like God, knowing good and evil. And you know, the only reason God doesn't want you to have that, he doesn't want you to be like him. He's withholding good. He feeds them lies, even in the perfect situation and circumstance, in paradise. That somehow God is withholding good. And so what do they do? They believe it. They disobey God. The consequences for their sin was also judgment, a judgment that brought sin and death into the world. If this can happen to Adam and Eve in paradise, in the most perfect situation and circumstance, you can imagine how easy it is for us to believe the same thing in a broken world. Think about how easy it is for us to be dissatisfied in our hearts, our marriages, our relationships, our jobs, our money, our cars, friendships, expectations of ourselves and others, our physical appearance, whatever. The list goes on and on. Any situation or circumstances, we are prone to be dissatisfied. The nature of our sin is to make you dissatisfied and to complain and grumble. Like the Israelites, we are unable to see God's goodness in the present because we misremember the past and assume a potential future is better. All the while, we are robbed of the present and being able to fully enjoy God and his provisions and be thankful for them. When we fall into this trap, we grumble, we complain. It's unbelief. It's disbelief in his character. It's disbelief in the per person of God. It's a lack of belief in his faithfulness. It's a lack of belief in his love, his care, his goodness. All of that is called in question. We put ourselves on the throne, and we start to judge God's character based on our faulty, sinful emotions and misperceptions of our circumstances and situations. That is why the consequences for this are so severe. Because this sin is significant. See, some of us are okay trusting God to a certain point, but when it's inconvenient, when it's hard, when we sense any level of discomfort, we start to question God. Just like the Israelites, we question why God has brought us to a certain situation and circumstance. 
Rather than trusting God in his word, we take things into our own hands. We take control and do what we want because we think we know better. We think we are wiser and we know what's best for ourselves and others. Whether you're a Christian or not here this morning, this applies to all of us. We fail to trust God because we fail to trust his character. We do not believe that God has our best in mind. Like the Israelites, we fail to acknowledge God's power. We don't appreciate his grace. We don't recognize his mercy. We don't accept his sovereignty. We don't trust his word. This is a sin being done in our hearts whenever we grumble or complain. And it's deserving of judgment. The complaining may be the outward expression, but that's what's going on in our hearts. And it's why the consequences for this sin before a holy and perfect God is death. Look at verse 7 and Israel's reaction to this judgment. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Notice, they don't think God is overreacting here. They realize that they have sinned, and what do they do? They repent. They ask Moses to intercede for them, for the snakes to go away. One minute they're complaining, the next moment they realize what they've done wrong. There's no blame shifting here. There are no excuses. What there is is a simple confession of sin, a recognition of what's gone wrong. They see clearly because they recognize the judgment they deserve. It's right in front of them. They deserve death. They see their need, and they repent. They don't make excuses or rationalize. They're complaining. They know that they deserve what they are getting for their sin, and they do the only thing they can. They acknowledge their sin and ask for mercy. By experiencing God's judgment for the consequences of their grumbling and complaining, they realize their sin, and they need to depend and trust in God. So they ask Moses to intercede for them, and he does. The good news for us is that we also have the hope of forgiveness in the gospel. Despite our own grumbling and complaining, despite our sin, the good news is that there's hope in the gospel to save us from, a, from this sin and all the other sins we commit. A forgiveness that can save us from the judgment that we rightfully deserve for our sin of complaining and grumbling. And that brings us to our last point. The cure for our complaining. The cure for our complaining, verses 8 and 9. The cure for our complaining. And the Lord said to Moses, verse 8, Make a fiery serpent, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and whoever is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Here in these verses, God provides a cure that has absolutely no human explanation for it, or why it's even effective, and yet it saves them. Makes no sense. He asked God to make a bronze statue to put on a pole so that anyone who sees it will not die but be saved. It's a bit odd, isn't it? The serpents, the snakes that are literally killing them, it's the thing that they need to look at to be made well. That's the last thing you would expect. Shouldn't there be some sort of medicine or some treatment or antidote? When you're being bitten by venomous snakes, the last thing you would want to look at is another snake in order to save you. And you certainly wouldn't expect it to actually do it, but here we are, you have a simple cure. Anyone who is bitten and about to die can look at this snake on a pole and live. If you've been in a hospital, or if you work in the medical field or been in an ambulance, all of us are actually familiar with this symbol. It's called the caduceus. In the US and all over the world, it's seen as a universal symbol for element. It's a snake around, a snake wrapped around the pole. It's a symbol for medicine, for healing, for a cure, and here are its origins, Numbers 21. Think about what this meant for the people. They had to look away from their circumstances. They had to look away from themselves, to look away from the snakes around them that were attacking them, to look away from those in pain who were dying, and to look to the cure. That's the only thing they could look at. They had to look at that, the cure that God had provided, the serpent raised up on a pool. These people have absolutely no power. They're helpless. There's nothing they can do to save themselves. They can't do anything to contribute to their cure. Whether they had just gotten bit, whether they were in excruciating pain and couldn't move, or even if they were in their last breath about to die, all they had to do was set their eyes on the means of salvation that God had provided them, to trust and believe that it would save them. They had nothing to do but to look and be saved. For those who did this, they lived. They are saved by God's cure. They had gone from distrusting God and his provisions to recognizing their need for mercy and putting all of their trust in the only provision, the only cure God had provided for them. So how does this apply to us? What can we learn from this 
And then how can we apply this to our own complaining and grumbling? Well, let's turn to John 3. John 3. It's in the New Testament. So you're doing your Bible, it's towards the right. John 3. In John 3, we have a prominent Pharisee, Nicodemus, who comes to Jesus at night. Likely because he doesn't want to be seen by the other Pharisees. And he actually admits that he know he believes that Jesus is from God. But he's seeking to know a little bit more about more about Jesus and his mission. Look there at verse 2 of chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God. So hey, we know that you're from God. I know that you're from God. For no one can do these signs unless God is with him. But again, he wants to know a little bit more about Jesus and his mission. So Jesus here attempts to reveal himself. Look how Jesus answers him in verse 3. Three, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born? Well, he's old. How can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and come out? Like, what? You want me to come out of my, you know, like, how do I do that again, right? <laughs> so, hey, flies over his head. Example number one, doesn't, it doesn't, it, you know, doesn't work. Nicodemus doesn't get it. So Jesus tries again. He says, truly, verse 5 there, Truly, truly, I say to you, no one is born of water and the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Nicodemus again just looks at him blankly like, don't get it. Still don't get it. Strike two, right? Nicodemus still doesn't get it. So Jesus tries yet again. Verse 7, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from, where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, how can these things be? Like, like, what are you talking about? Jesus says, are you not a teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things that I'm telling you? I say to you, we speak of what we know, and you bear witness and what you have seen. But you do not receive my testimony. You don't receive our testimony. So he's saying, look, aren't you a teacher? How are you not getting what I'm saying? The issue is I'm telling you, and you just don't get it. You won't accept what I'm telling you. So again, strike three for Nicodemus. <laughs> but Jesus is gracious. He's going to give Nicodemus one more thing, one more try, and now he uses the scripture. Because if there's one thing a Pharisee knows, it's his Torah, right? Yeah. <laughs> the scripture. So what does Jesus say? Look at verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man may be lifted up, mm. that whoever believes in him may have eternal life life. Jesus uses Numbers 21 to explain to Nicodemus who he is and what faith looks like. How can one be born again? How can one be saved? The cure for our sin is looking to Jesus lifted up on the cross, just like the snake was lifted up on the pole. That is the cure. And why does Jesus do that? Why is Jesus going to do that? Look at John, the next verse. We all know this one, John 3, 16. For, because, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved through him. If you're a Christian in the United States, everyone, you probably have this verse memorized, you probably have it in a mug somewhere in your house. But we often don't see this verse in its context and what Jesus is trying to reveal himself and how it connects to Numbers 21. See, the snake in the wilderness symbolized their judgment for their grumbling and complaining, the thing that was killing them, but it was also their cure, what they had to do to look for salvation. For us, the cross functions the same way. When we look to the cross, we see the judgment that we deserve for our sin. We see our sin, but instead of us receiving the judgment, Jesus bears our sin and takes on our judgment at the cross. And when we look to it, we also see the cure for our sin. It's where we find salvation. If you're not a Christian here this morning, all of us complain and grumble on top of all the other sins we commit, and we rightfully deserve God's judgment. We deserve death. However, the good news is that Jesus came into the world, lived a sinless life, died taken on the cross. He became sin for us, so we would not have to perish, we have eternal life, and provided us, provided us with the righteousness of God so we could be right with him. And as we read in John 3, 16, he does this out of love for us. Jesus rose from the dead to guarantee that he had accomplished his work, so we don't have to fear being condemned, but can rejoice and indeed are saved from him. When we look to the cross, we not only see the reality of our sin and judgment, but we also see the cure, the hope that we have for the forgiveness of sins. Just like the Israelites, there's nothing we can do to cure our sinful hearts. 
The Israelites were not asked to perform or do anything other than to look. It is the same with us. All we have to do is look to the cross, to look at what Jesus has done for us. We are not saved by what we do and who we are, but by who he is and what he's done for us. Look to the cross, repent, and trust in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian here, the cure to our own grumbling is looking to Jesus lifted up on the cross, just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. The cross is the cure. We need to, we need to recognize the tendency that we have to focus on ourselves instead of Jesus. The cross is the cure to this because it shows me that God has provided my biggest need. It shows me how God is working all things for my good. It shows me that God is sovereign and trustworthy. It shows me that he's for my ultimate good. It shows me that he knows what's best. It helps me recall God's love for me in Christ. You can trust that you can look to him. A small practical way to do this in your life is perhaps journal weekly, even daily, and list down the various things that God provides for you in your life, the evidences of grace that you see. Or perhaps it's setting an alarm two to three times a day, a brief maybe two, three minutes where you can just go to God in prayer and thank him for the way he's providing for you. Over time, you'll see that you can trust his goodness, his sovereignty, his wisdom, his care for you. Romans 8.32 tells us, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things we need? Give us all things. Brothers and sisters, if we can trust him with our salvation, we don't need to complain about our situations or circumstances because we can trust him, knowing that he has provided for our greatest need. Echo Church, this is really important for us to consider because it matters for our evangelism. It's necessary to keep this in mind as a church, especially as we seek to make disciples in our mission. Listen to Philippians 2. Do all things without grumbling or complaining. Why? So that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among who you shine as a light in the world. You hear that in Philippians 2? It calls us to not complain or grumble so that you would actually be a light to those around you. The reason is that as Christians, complaining and grumbling is a contradiction to what we say about God. We say God is sovereign. We say God is good. We say God is gracious. We say he's caring. We say he's wise. And all of those things are true. But our complaining says otherwise. At best, our complaining says that God is absent. And at worst, it communicates that God is not any of those things. It's doubting his character. See, when we repent and believe in the gospel, this changes us and it changes how we view all of our situations and circumstances because we know we've come to know God and his character. We know that God does all things for our good and his glory. And we can rest securely in his love and care for us. When we are intentional about limiting our complaining, we look away from ourselves and our wants and our kingdom, and we can actually focus on being on mission and building God's kingdom instead of our own. When we look to the cross, when we focus on God's goodness, we are able to shine as a light in a dark world, allowing others to look to us and to, to, to give them a picture of the cross and be saved. That's the beauty of our message. Anyone, no matter what situation or circumstance, is able to look to the cross and be saved. This has always been God's plan. So we need to remember this. Isaiah 45, 22 says, look to, all the, look to me, all the ends of the world, and be saved. Look to me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved. This was actually the verse that saved Charles Spurgeon when he was 15 years old. He walked into a church in the middle of a snowstorm. The normal preacher wasn't able to go there because of the storm. So an older gentleman in the church gets up. There's no one who can preach. No one who can do it. So this guy gets up, and he decides to read a verse and say a few words. And he reads this verse. Look to me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved. And this is what he says. My dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now look and don't take a great deal of pain. It ain't lifting your foot or a finger. It's just look. A man doesn't need to go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yet you can look. A man doesn't need to be worth thousands a year to be able to look. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. Many of, all, many of y'all are looking to yourselves. But it is no use looking there. Look to Christ. Immediately after he reads this verse, he looked right at Spurgeon and said, Young man, you look very miserable. 
miserable in life, and you'll always be miserable. Miserable in life and miserable in death if you do not obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Then lifting up his hands, he shouted, young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing but to do but to look and live. In that moment, just like the Israelites, Spurgeon was saved by looking at Christ. This is how you recall that moment. I saw at once the way of salvation. I really don't know what else he said. I didn't take much notice of it because I was so possessed by that one thought. Just as the brazen serpent was lifted up, the people only looked and were healed. So it was with me. When I heard that word, look, what a charming word it seemed to me. Oh, I looked until I could I almost lift my eyes away. Then and there, the cloud was gone. The darkness had rolled away. And in that moment, I saw the sun. And I could have risen in that instant and sung the most enthusiastic of them, of the precious blood of Jesus and the simple faith which looks to him alone. This is what we have in Christ. A simple faith where we find all our hope in looking to him and him alone. It's not about us or what we do. It's about looking to him. In closing, Echo Church, our grumbling and complaining is sin and deserving of God's judgment. But God graciously provides a cure to look to Christ on the cross. It doesn't mean we won't struggle or have situations in our circumstances we are tempted to grumble and complain. However, if we really do believe that God has provided our greatest need, we can trust him in all the areas of our lives, no matter the situation or the circumstance. When we look to Jesus lifted up, we recall God's grace towards us, his deliverance, his redemption. When we repent, it puts God back in the center of our lives. It won't be easy, but every situation and every circumstance we face is a chance to cling to and put, put, put our confidence in the unchanging grace and goodness of God. The Bible, time and time again, calls us to rejoice in our trials. And again, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy or pleasant, or that we need to pretend that they're not hard. But the good news is we can look to Jesus and what he's done for us. Here, we find the ultimate proof of God's provision, of God's love, his goodness towards us. No matter what you face, know that our hope and contentment rests in a God whose character is unchanging, and that is always something that we can be thankful for. Look to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we don't have to wonder or guess who you are. Thank you that we are not left feeling the consequences of our sin, despite knowing that what we have in our hearts, the cause of it, it is, is deserving of judgment and punishment that is just. Thank you that you provide the cure. Father, I pray that we would look away from our circumstances and situations and look to the cure that you provide. Jesus, may we trust in him fully. May that result in worship and thankfulness towards him. In Christ's name, amen.